So hi, welcome everybody to my talk about uh, Android. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually more or less uh, issues from the past. That's what I start with. Um, I'm going a little bit into the Android security and uh, code concept. And uh, afterwards, I'm going to talk about uh, techniques for pen testers and reverse engineers. And in the end, I hope that's the most interesting part where I dive into some uh, experiences and general quality uh, of apps, what, what I experienced at least. So my approach basically was I bought the HTC Desire uh, last year. It's, uh, it was on Android 2.0. It's now updated to 2.2.0. And um, yeah, my approach was, of course, finding security related issues because I'm a pen tester. So obviously, that's what I'm looking for. Um, well, let's start with the issues in the past. Um, basically, uh, a lot of people are uh, losing their phones these days. And uh, it's getting closer to losing your laptop because most people have like all their credentials and emails and everything on their mobile. So um, when I bought my HTC Desire for testing purposes, I bought it on eBay. And when I got the phone, uh, the guy who sold it to me actually wiped it or factory reset it. But when you do that, there's actually a big pop-up which says, yeah, the SD card is not going to be wiped. And so uh, of course, he forgot to wipe the SD card afterwards. And I got all his private data, like uh, pictures and everything on it. So first time I plugged it in, I already had private data of someone else. So that was quite an easy beginning. Um, and the next thing, if you look at these phones, it is actually you have these lock screens, right? And as a pen tester, you always want to get around these uh, lock screens. So I was looking for um, one, possi uh, one possibility for uh, my phone. And uh, I googled around a little bit, and what I found was actually that um, on Android you have to draw a pattern to unlock the phone, so uh, it's not a pin. But uh, to circumvent this, I simply power it off first. And as you will see when I power it on again, um, it's a rooted phone. You will see at the, s at the splash screen that it's rooted, but it, it would also work for non-rooted phones. So I just rooted mine, so you will see the splash screen. And what I'm doing right now is um, I'm hitting the uh, home button very, very often and very fast during the startup process all the time. And well, that's basically the hack, as we will see. So um, I'm still hitting the button. And yeah, you have to be quite fast. You have to have qu uh, fast fingers. And we're in. We circumvented the lock screen. So uh, yeah, it's actually quite a funny start if you just have to Google around a little bit. And the first, the first measure of security is already circumvented for on the first Google it. Um, so basically, uh, there are some other techniques. So one is uh, the, the technique I just showed. It works for uh, not all brands, but for some of them uh, on Android 2.2 and below. Um, some also uh, allow to just press the back button during call. So you call the phone, press the back button, and you also circumvented the lock screen. Um, some allow to just plug in into the car dock. So you take the phone, uh, plug it in, and you have access to the phone. And what is also a feature is that when you actually forgot your uh, um, lock pattern, you can type in your uh, lock pattern 20 times incorrectly, and then it will ask for your Gmail address and password. And in the beginning, it was incorrectly implemented, so you specified the correct Gmail address, but as a password, you just typed in null, and it worked. So that was also a bug. It's now fixed. Um, well, and of course, a lot of people just don't have no lock screen activated. That's also, so if you find a phone, just First, most, most of them are like, you just can access them without any security meshes at all. And uh, another thing is, uh, a lot of people have USB debug on, so that means you have like, um, the debug feature is enabled, so you can just connect via ADB shell. ADB shell is basically, 
um, like SSH over uh, the USB cable. And another way to circumvent it is, of course, the SS if you know the SSH, the Google account, the Gmail uh, address and password. Because, yeah, of course, now it's fixed, but then you can just um, draw the pattern 20 times incorrectly, enter Gmail address and password, and you're in. Um, some milestone before Android 2.1 had also a bug in the bootloader, loader, so you could just um, load this open recovery image, and you have an ADB shell as well. And what also a lot of forensic tools do is like uh, just acquire the physical memory directly. So what I get for, uh, from a lot of people is like, is Android now open source, or is it Google's, or what's up? And um, Android is actually open source, so you can contribute, you can download the code, whatever. But of course, Google is the strong force behind it, and they will push development. And the Google market is actually not open source. So the Google market itself, where you get the apps from, is controlled by Google. And um, you can create your own market. But basically, if you buy an Android phone these days, there's always the Google market inst uh, installed. So all the people will use that. So basically, uh, it's still the Android um, field is more or less um, owned by, by Google. Talking about the Google market, it's actually a really a feel-free environment. Um, what I mean is like, this is an error message the user gets um, for some apps. So it's like uh, with swear words in it. Um, and uh, I found that in one app. And actually, I think that won't, wouldn't pass the uh, App Store um, verification. So on Google market, they're not checking the apps, but uh, Apple does for its uh, App Store. So I guess. Apple wouldn't like that. And you can also see that if you go to the uh, Android website, uh, on the market website, and you search for ASDF, you find um, apps like test app, please ignore, and uh, like just random stuff on the Google market. So you can just put on malware there. Nobody will look at it. And a lot of uh, users will download it, actually. It's all, most people who just, uh, put on some uh, random apps on the market, there are always like 500 users who will download it. It, it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talking about malware, mm, Droid Dream, um, it's also called Root Cager, was uh, one of the malwares which made it into the Google market. Most of them are just spread over different markets in China, most of them. And the funny thing was that Droid Dream um, was detected by Google, and they wrote a remover tool for this malware. Um, but actually, the malware writers thought, yeah, well, if they do a remover tool, we do our own remover tool as well. So they uh, wrote an, their own remover tool, which was actually another piece of malware. And um, they put it on the Chinese markets. So it's the beachy surf is the remover tool. And the funny thing about that piece of malware is that Part of it is, op uh, is released as open source, so you can download part of the code f uh, of, the, of the malware. And <laughs> yeah, the guys are pretty funny. They put it on uh, Google Code, so you can download the code from the Google Code page. OK, um, if you want to bring malware to the mobile, at, as I said, the, the easiest thing is just to convince the user or just put it on market. It will, somebody will download it. And um, another thing which John Oberheide uh, found out is that a cross-site scripting on the Google Market website is also fi sufficient. So on Android, you basically have two options to install apps. First um, is you take your mobile, open the Market app, and say, yeah, please install that app. And it will install it. The other way is if you log into the website, uh, marketandroid.com, and uh, you install an app there. With you log in with your Google account, which is associated with your mobile phone, and it will push it down over the Google push service. And it gets installed. So cross-site scripting is actually enough. So if you're finding uh, cross-site scripting on the Google Market website, just uh, give me an e uh, send me an email or something. It would be pretty interesting. Um, another thing, what uh, malware also, also does is that um, if, an app, uh, if, if a user installs an app, he has to 
um, say, okay, this app can access my SD card and my geolocation and everything. Um, but there are some exploits which just, um, if you already have an app on the mobile, this app can exploit vulnerability to install another app. So basically, there is an app which has no permissions at all, and it will exploit something to install another app which has all the permissions. And uh, one thing was this uh, Angry Birds extra level malware, which was uh, done by John Oberheide. And there are some other vulnerabilities, for, for example, the Android browser is vulnerable to cookie stealing or basically cross site scripting on, um, you can do cross site scripting from within an app for every website. Uh, it's now fixed. And there's actually also a new technique going to be released in November, also by Oberheide and Lani at Source Barcelona. So the Android browser, actually, I did some tests with uh, different mobile um, OS. Uh, I used uh, Apple and uh, Mo Windows Phone 7 and Android. And I was able to crash the Internet Explorer on uh, Windows Phone and also Safari on the iPhone. But I was never able to crash the Android browser. Well, it could be that Google just used the same fuzzer as I did. And that's why they already detected all the problems. Um, so I think the Android browse browser is actually quite good normally. Um, but what I don't like, it, like about it is that it puts bookmark pictures on your SD card. So SD card is actually a non-protected storage area. So everybody who finds your mobile can put out the SD card and plug it into his PC and access all the data on it. And what's what the Android browser does is it if you make a bookmark, it will store a small picture of how the website looks like and stores it on the SD card. So on my mobile, there's actually a small bookmark picture with my Facebook account and my SPB, um, what, I, what I was searching for. And well, if you do this, if you bookmark your uh, mobile banking session, it will also put a picture of your mobile banking session on the SD card. It's more like a privacy issue, but still, it's not, not that nice. There are a lot of other issues with Android. They're getting better and better, but there were a lot in, in the past. Another issue is um, that the new version of the Facebook app uh, from version uh, 1.6 on, it's able to read, write, and edit your uh, SMS and MMS. And the worst part is that you cannot remove the uh, Facebook app from the Android phone because it's, um, it's in a special protected area of the storage. Um, there were some other issues with plain authentication tokens. So like session IDs were sent over HTTP. So if somebody was sniffing, he could uh, use these authentication tokens to access, uh, I think it was Picasa. And uh, sometimes the SMS receive was just simply incorrect. So you were writing uh, an SMS to your girlfriend, but in the end, uh, your boss got the SMS. So it was quite strange. Um, another issue was just uncovered some weeks ago, the HCC logger, uh, which means that it's a service that is running on HCC. And uh, you can query it, for example, for the geolocation, even when your app doesn't have the uh, permission to access the geolocation. Of course, there's also some app reversing going on. I'm not the first one doing this. Mm, and it's getting more and more. And of course, there are a lot of other issues. So. Um, one day I found this uh, small comment on XKCD, and it says basically the nuclear chain of command in America, it's like the president is on top, like he's in charge, but actually um, he ha only has a red button. And if the engineer who installed the red button um, didn't install it correctly, the president can press it as long as he wants, and it, it will do nothing. So like the engineer um, is actually the one who is in charge, right? And this is somehow similar to uh, the Android situation because um, here we have Google on top and Google is fixing all these security vulnerabilities and like um, uh, updating their software. But actually on the other side, you have manufacturers and providers that don't provide you with updates. So we're now on Android 2.35 and actually uh, Mike Mobile 
is up to date, as we will see, and it's still on 222. Uh, no, actually even uh, 220. So my situation right now is I bought the phone last year. Um, I'm still on Android 220, uh, and my phone tells me, yeah, you're up to date, you're fine, everything is, is good. And uh, well, basically I'm vulnerable to the screen lock circumvention we saw, to the Droid Dream malware, these browser vulnerabilities, cookie stealing, cross-site scripting, uh, apps can install other apps. So basically, this is really scary, um, especially if you not only have a testing phone, but your private phone is the same. So <laughs> okay, let's talk about the um, security and code concept of Android. Uh, when you write code for Android, um, normally you write it in Java and HTML and JavaScript use the Android SDK. It's the most obvious approach, and I would say like 95% of all apps on the market just use this approach. Um, and of course, because it's Java, and uh, HTML JavaScript is already plain, you can uh, decompile, disassemble, and reassemble the stuff very easily. And well, another option would be to write uh, apps in ARM native code, but actually uh, nobody does it. And if you find an app that does it, you can just uh, do normal ARM uh, assembler reverse engineering. So that gets a normal uh, reverse engineering task as usual. You can also use uh, some frameworks generators. Uh, I only know uh, two of them, appmake.com and PhoneGap. I think there are others. Uh, I had some slides about these two, but it was li a little bit kiddie style, so I, I skipped them. Um, well, okay, let's dive into some techniques for pen testers and reverse engineers. So if you want to analyze Android apps, um, you have to get these APK files. So APK files are basically uh, just Android apps. So one APK file is one a Android app. And my approach was actually, I want to look into a lot of Android apps, not just one or two. So what I first did was I opened the market uh, app on my mobile. I clicked the app and said install, and afterwards I SSH'd into the mobile phone and just secure copied over the uh, APK file. Uh, that works f if you just want to download one or two apps, but actually it's slow and there's not enough space on the mobile, so every one of these apps gets installed on your mobile. So what I did was actually, um, I tried to circumvent it so that not all these apps get installed on my mobile. So I connected my mobile phone to the laptop uh, with, uh, over Wi-Fi. So I made a new Wi-Fi access point on my uh, laptop. I used IP tables to redirect the, um, the traffic on port 80 to a local burp instance. Burp is actually just a HTTP proxy. Nothing too fancy, just an HTTP proxy. Um, and yeah, I had to use IP tables because I could not specify a proxy in Android because Android has no proxy options. And uh, I use burp extended, that's the scripting engine of this proxy, to uh, save the responses with the APK files to my laptop. So um, they're not stored on my mobile, but on, on the laptop. And in the end, my laptop uh, saved the APK file, the Android app, but sent my mobile a 404 not found. So it told my mobile, yeah, there is there's no such app. And my mobile said, okay, well, if there is no such app, then that's fine. And but actually, the APK file was stored on my laptop. So, um, right, uh, like this, I could just uh, click an app on the market, and it sends a request to Google over the Wi-Fi of my uh, laptop. And when the app comes back, it gets stored, and uh, my mobile doesn't notice anything. It just says, "Okay, the, the app is not coming." Um, now the problem is I don't want to like click every app on my mobile, right? So I had to find out a way to inst to say Google, please install all the apps that are on 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 Android on the Android market. And so I found out that uh, you just have to send one HTTP request to the Google Market website, and you just have to change the app name inside that request, and it will it will install that app. So. Now I had the problem, now I know that I just have to send this request, but I have to find out all these app names, right? 
So <laughs> the next step was to, uh, to use a tool called W3AF. Actually, it doesn't matter. That's actually a web application scanner. But I just used it because I know that crawler. So I used that spider a crawler and uh, wrote a regex plugin, which just writes out all the app names from the Google Market website. So I told the crawl to go to the Google Market website, search for terms A to ZZ, and write all out all the app names that are displayed. There were actually no restrictions at all, so you can just search, do as many search on the Google Market website as you want. Um, well, in the end, I wrote a script to send these HTTPS requests. It takes the app names from the file and sends it to Google. So maybe that was a little bit uh, fast. So this is like the entire environment. Um, first of all, we have the crawler who looks for all the app names. And basically, we just have the, um, a line separated file which has all the app names in it. Then a small Python script takes these app names and sends uh, requests to Google. Please install that app. Google will say, OK, I'll push down the app over the uh, Google push service. And my app tables will say, oh, that's traffic on port 80. Redirect it to Burp. Burp will say, oh, I have a scripting engine who wants to know what I'm doing. So it will redirect it to Burp extender. And the Burp extender will save the file. So we have the APK file and send the mobile over the Wi-Fi and HP 404 not found. So basically, uh, there are about 300,000 apps in the market. I crawled about 10,000 app names. And I successfully downloaded about 3,500, about 50 gigabytes. It took me about three days, but I uh, just uh, left it running. So now we have these APK files, right? This is an Android app. Uh, what do we do with it? So we can decompile and disassemble it. If we want to disassemble it, um, well, actually, APK is nothing else than a zip, zip file. So you can basically just unzip it. But then you have all this um, main.xml. It's not really an XML, but it's a binary format, binary XML. So you would have to convert it first. And also the classes.dex, that's where actually the, uh, the code, the, the um, Java code is stored. And uh, it's just one file, everything in one file. So it's not really handy to do anything with it. You, you, don't, you cannot read the XML files and so on. So what you use is actually APK tool, which is much better because you get real XML files. Um, for example, in Android manifest.xml, you can just uh, look up which permissions uh, the app is using. And what it produces as well is that um, classes.dex uh, is converted to small e codes. So we'll see in a minute um, what small e code actually is. Or yeah. Um, so we have basically two approaches if you want to decompile and disassemble. Disassembling and decompiling. So disassembling is done um, with small e code. So small e is similar to Jasmine syntax. Um, Jasmine, I hope somebody knows it. It's a Java assembler code. It's like assembler code for Java. And uh, small e is very similar to it. You use the APK, I use the APK tool actually just because um, it produces correct small code. So you can reuse it, you can recompile it, and it will work. Um, I haven't used Dexdump or uh, Ddexer, which basically do the same, but APK tool was uh, enough reliable. And the other approach would be decompiled to Java. Um, small code is pretty easy to read, as we will see later, um, but Java is, of course, uh, even even better or nicer to read. Uh, you use text to, uh, text to char and uh, just a standard Java decompiler. The problem is actually that it produces sometimes incorrect Java code. So if you have incorrect Java code, you cannot take this code and recompile it again to uh, to an Android app. So the disassembling how to is actually just one command. You'd say uh, Java minus char apk tool dot char. Uh, D is for decompile um, or disassemble. Sorry, uh, app dot apk is the apk file we want to uh, disassemble, and we specify the output folder. So small e um, this is small e example. Small e code is actually pretty easy to read. We have a method called is authenticated, 
the set at the end indicates that it's uh, going to return a Boolean value. The locals one means there is uh, one register um, which this method uses. So basically, uh, Dalvik, that's the, the Java VM for Android, is uh, register-based, um, unlike the normal Java VM. And well, you can read that code. It's not that hard to read. I mean, it's like I get object, so it gets some object from here. It's a Dropbox client. And if equals zero, like we know that from normal assemble code, so it, it's not really hard to read. And there's some jumping going around. So it's pretty, pretty easy to read. Um, the reassembling is also really, really easy. You just change something in the code we just saw. And for example, we just return always one or, or true. For, for the is authentication method. So we're always authenticated. And um, you just specify B for build the output folder where we sort the um, APK tool output before and the new name for the app. Um, what you have to do as well is uh, so, uh, sign the char, uh, sorry, the APK file because Android will only accept files that are signed. Uh, Self-signed is fine because the only reason why it has to be signed is actually because every update has to be signed with the same key again. So if you want to update your app, you have to sign it with the same key. So basically, you produce a new key. Um, you say, char sign, please sign that, uh, that APK file. And the last line already installs it on your uh, mobile. So ADB install means um, if you connect your phone uh, over the USB cable and you have USB debug on, uh, it will install the app. So really, really easy. OK, there are some other techniques for pen tester which are uh, pretty helpful. There are a lot more, but just uh, explain some of them. Um, you can make heap dumps, actually, on Android. Uh, of course, y you have to be root, so you have to root your uh, phone first. But that should be no problem at all. Um, you can find out the um, process ID. And afterwards, with uh, kill minus 10, you can produce heap dumps. So um, you will find the heap dump in data misc, and you can grab f for it. For example, here, what I did was, I, for those of you who know KeyPass, otherwise it's not that important, but uh, I opened KeyPass database, I entered my master password, and I added a new password into the key store. And when you look at the uh, heap dump afterwards, you still find the new password I include. So basically, you can uh, look which which um, variables are still stored in, in the heap if, you, if you're reversing an app. On Android uh, 2.3 and above, you have to do it a little bit different, but it no, doesn't matter. OK, another thing is actually invoking activity. So an activity on Android is basically one screen. Like you have one screen, you have some buttons, and if, if you click one, it changes to another screen, right? And a lot of apps have like the first screen is your login screen. And if you don't um, type it in correctly, you won't get to the screen too. Now, the problem is a lot of developers don't check if um, on screen two, um, again, if, if, he if he's already logged in. So basically, you can just um, uh, start an activity directly. So you can here you start the password activity directly, which is maybe the second screen. And you so you don't have to log in on the first screen. screen. Unfortunately, this example doesn't work because KeyPass is correctly implemented. OK, there are tons of other tools. Uh, Android Guard, I, I won't get uh, talk about all of them. And I haven't actually used all of them. But uh, it's getting more and more every, every month. And when I started, uh, there were actually not that, much to that many tools. And uh, well, also, the thing I, I explained with downloading the APK files, today you have a Google Market API. So you would just basically use that, um, that library to, to download these APK files. But I was just um, trying to, to uh, tell you how you can uh, tackle these problems if you just want to, uh, if you know there is something on the wire and you, have to, you want to uh, um, store it on your laptop. So I hope this is now the uh, most interesting part, my experiences when uh, decompiling and disassembling so many apps. Um, as I said, um, 3,500 apps. 
I found about 2.3k uh, email addresses, so if you want to spam around. Uh, yeah, They're, the developers really love swear words. They really love it. And uh, you find a lot of uh, Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, geocaching, API keys. So I don't really get the point of API keys anymore because it's like a key, so not everybody can, but somehow you can just extract them from everywhere. Okay, so let's talk about um, some low-hanging fruits I found. But first, let's do just a small hashing and encryption short best practice refresh. So if you want to hash and encrypt, you should use secure algorithms and implementations, random and long salts. And when you do hashing, you should um, use a separate salt for every hash. That's just best practice. You should use uh, several hashing rounds. And when you do encryption, that's the most important part. If you do encryption, you should keep the key secret. I mean, there's no point in encrypting anything if you don't keep the key secret. So um, this guy here, it's not that bad, but he just used a, a static salt, right? And he was in the process of um, thinking about, yeah, now I have to like um, hash something else, and I don't want to use the same salt. But he was not like um, dynamically creating random salts. But what he did, he was like, oh, well now I need a better one. So I write in this one even better and the same salt again. So, but still static. So it would have been much better if he just produ produces uh, one on the fly and then store it along with the hash. Um, yeah, now we're getting to the interesting part. Um, this is an AES key because here it's a byte array and then we see well, you use it, oh, we produce a key. So basically, whatever encryption is going on here, we have the key for it, so we can decrypt it. And the funny thing about this key was actually, when I was looking at it, um, a byte is normally like from 0 to 255, right? Um, but none of them is over 128. So. Uh, the most significant bit of this key for every byte is uh, zero, and I was wondering why. Why would anybody just? What was his? What was he thinking? And the problem is actually, I guess that if you want to use integers like this to initialize uh, an, a byte array, um, you have to use signed integers. You cannot use unsigned, so you cannot use uh, zero to 255, but you have to use uh, minus. 128 to 127. And so the developer was like just trying out and was like, okay, 128 doesn't work, so I'll just use uh, numbers from 0 to 127. Actually, it was used to send passwords in HTTPS, so it was still protected by SSL, so it, it, it's not that bad. Um, yeah, there are more of these guys who do the same. Can anybody read the secret message? Olympic soccer world cup hockey something um, yeah. but still secret key in in the app so simply use it decrypt it it was used to signalize the server that in games goods were purchased so this was actually a game and now I'm the fish tank master because I have all the fishes in, in the fish tank game so basically yeah really good at it now um, yeah no comment on this one. And um, yeah, please don't crack me. Um, what some of the apps try is um, obfuscate their code. Um, as most of us know, obfuscating code doesn't really help most of the time. Um, if you look at this code, it doesn't matter actually what is going on, uh, on down here, but as we see, there's some secret key factory and some secret key anything. And um, we see that there's an A array, a B array, and one parameter to this uh, constructor. So if we know all the inputs to an encryption routine, um, we know uh, how to decrypt it as well, right? So I was wondering, OK, we have this byte array, but where is this coming from? Is it user supplied or key derivation function or whatever? So the question is, who calls this AH constructor? And of course, four grabs later, you'll find the answer. 
there's a class called c.f because obfuscators always like shorten uh, class names. So there's a class called c.f. It includes, let's say, a string. c.f calls a.bs. a.bs calls a.ah with the key. a.ah uses the key and all the local variables for encryption. We know all the input data for the encryption routine. It's in metric crypto, so we can decrypt it, whatever it might be. Um, some other stuff I found was that one guy was uh, writing an email parser. So he wrote the class test something, .java. And he said, yeah, I'll have to test the class. So he just pasted in one of his emails. So I could r read all his, or one of his emails. That's not that bad, but mm, well, basically you should remove that Java file before uh, s sending it to the Google market. And the same guy thought, yeah, I'll also have to authenticate against the server. So he wrote in his email ID, his user ID, his password, his server name, and his domain name. So you have all the credentials you need to access the corporate server. Okay, that was just the uh, low-hanging fruits. Like, uh, sometimes I don't even know what the encryption is used for, or I just don't care. But yeah, there are, there are really a lot of keys um, in, the, in the code. And let's look at some apps I looked more closely. Uh, the first one is a banking app. And I always wonder uh, who really wants banking on the mobile. I think it's not the IT security guys most of the time. There are a lot of apps who, uh, which do banking uh, on the Android platform. And this one uh, had no obfuscation at all. It could be easily be recompiled, so I just changed some code and recompiled it again and said, yes, send the credentials to my server, please. And um, the app simply shows the website. So the app is actually nothing else than a worse browser. So it's like uh, the app opens, there's one window, it loads the, uh, the normal ebanking.whatever.com website. And the problem with it is that it hides the URL. So whenever you uh, uh, told your users, yeah, you have to check if it's HTTPS or just HTTP. Um, and it also hides the SSL certificate or the small lock, lock uh, you have normally for SSL connections. So you cannot tell your user anymore, yeah, you have to check if it's HTTPS or whatever, because you won't see anything. If he downloads the wrong app, which has exactly the same name as the real app, and it's just from another vendor, which is, has a similar name. You know, on the Google market, you can put everything. Um, yeah, how sh should he know he's not connecting to his bank? And another problem is that this app can only be used with MTAN. So you get a mobile TAN, so you get an SMS on your mobile with um, as a two-factor authentication, right? But the problem is two-factor authentication means there are two factors. So an attacker has to own two things or to know two things or whatever to um, really get through with his, his attack. But actually, if there's malware on the mobile, he, he, uh, the user types in his password into the mobile the, and he gets the SMS on the mobile, so the malware can read everything. So basically, this... Uh, two-factor authentication is a little bit useless because it's, um, well, not, no, that's not correct. It's not useless, but, uh, well, it's not that good. Well, to be honest, there, there is actually an, uh, another option. You, you don't have to use MTAN. You can also use a USB stick, but I'm not sure how you plug in your USB stick into your mobile, so I guess it won't work. So Dr. Evil will be very happy to um, write some malware for the Android uh, Okay, um, another app, which the first problem was that it has a, uh, had a self-signed SSO certificate, uh, which is bad on its own. So we did a man-in-the-middle attack, um, standard man-in-the-middle attack for SSL. And uh, what we saw was something like, oh, there's, that's not really the, the password we entered as a test. So uh, basically, it looks like encrypted. So don't we need a key for that? And of course, you'll just find it in the app. So self-signed uh, SSL certificate and uh, key in the app is pretty fail. 
Um, now another topic. Um, some mobile device management vendors try to um, sell their customers. Like, you can detect if a phone is rooted or not. And one of these um, vendors tried had this code in it. So the method is called device root, and it um, tries to execute su, the super user command. And if it works, it returns true, so the device is rooted. Otherwise, the device is not rooted. So I was thinking, yeah, well, that could be hard to like, like circumvent this, because every app can call su if, if, if the phone is really rooted. But then I realized, well, when I did my routing, there was an app installed which is called superuser.apk. And this superuser.apk Android app does nothing else than before an app is granted superuser permission, it asks the user. So it was not necessary to circumvent this uh, root detection. So basically, um, the app is, is uh, asking you, oh, there's, there's an, an app from your company which, is, which wants to get root permissions. And you just say, remember and deny, and your company will never notice that your uh, phone is rooted. So the feature of this uh, device management solution is not going to work at all. Of course, another vendor is trying exactly the same. Like, they're doing it a little bit different. They're checking if the system has been so far uh, exists or not. And basically, um, I thought, yeah, let's, let's uh, alter this app and change something. So um, I uh, disassembled it. And then I used the SCD command. Well, basically, it just um, changes SBIN SU to a, a system SBIN KVPSLK. And I guess there is actually no, um, no file called with this name on an Android system in system SBIN. So the detection will always fail. And I, I signed it again and uploaded it again. And well, it worked quite well. But what I was asking myself was that a good method to remove the uh, root detection because every time there's an update, I have to do this uh, disassembling, changing, and reassembling again. And actually, we only want to fail that simple check. So um, to prevent the root detection, well, the upper stuff is not that important. But actually, what I did was I looked into the path variable and just moved the su command from system s bin su to system xbin, and it's inside the path, so all the apps will still find it. But as you remember, the app was checking for the entire path, so system sbin su, and it won't find the su command there, but it will, well, all the other apps will just execute su normally and will find it. So that um, root detection was broken as well. So the lesson learned is a little bit, uh, root stays root. I mean, the user is root on that phone, so he has the highest privilege of all. And now the company is installing some app, which has normal Android privileges. And the unprivileged thing is trying to, to, um, to check and control root. Somehow it doesn't work. Like There's always a way uh, around it, because you have more permi permissions than this app. Well, and. One day I realized there's actually a really special secret key. Uh, 445 apps use the same AES key. I was wondering, why would all these apps use the same AES key? And the winner is Google Ads. What they do actually is they encrypt the last known location of the user, so they um, get all the geolocation information from GPS, your Wi-Fi, and they encrypt it with the key we saw. And they send it via the UULE JSON parameter to the Google servers. And well, I notify Google, but it seems they don't care. And well, actually, to be honest, I haven't seen the UULE parameter on my network yet. I still have to do that. But the thing is just why is Google Ads using symmetric crypto. When they use asymmetric crypto, nobody on the network would be able to decrypt it because you only have like the public key. 
and the public key, for example, is only used for encrypted encryption, and nobody can decrypt it because you don't have the private key because it's only stored on the Google server. So what I simply don't guess, it's not that a, of a big problem, but uh, if they do encryption, if they implement it and use it, uh, well, then they should use asymmetric crypto because it's just uh, secure, because this version right now doesn't help at all because everybody knows uh, the key. So the countermeasures are basically um, developers should use more asymmetric crypto instead of symmetric crypto. So attackers on the network cannot decrypt uh, the traffic. They should store more hashes and session tokens instead of passwords. A lot of apps are still storing passwords in, the, uh, in, in plain. And actually the protection mechanism is uh, like the Linux kernel. Android is just another Linux. And basically ev every app is one, uh, is one user. And one user cannot read the data from another user. And that's the protection mechanism. But yeah, as we all know, there are a lot of uh, kernel exploits and stuff. So there are a lot of uh, routing exploits around. Well, yeah, and good obfuscation is just security through obscurity, of course. You should pen test your app, so I have a lot of work to do. And um, you should also know the limitations. Of course, uh, root stays root. Here are some references, and thanks. You can follow me on Twitter or just visit my website. Are there any questions? Not sure if it's working. It is working, yes. Sorry. In your point of view, with uh, your experience, what is the best uh, device, Android device, to make uh, security researches? Uh, the best device? Well, actually, it depends not that much on the device, unless you're um, like really going for the specific stuff. Like HTC is different from Samsung, and well, in the end, it's also important which Android version. That's actually more important which Android version uh, you're running. Because for example, Android 4.0, which is not out yet, but it will, has, uh, it will have ASLR, and it will also have a keychain, so you don't have to store all these passwords in plain anymore. So it, it's more important which Android version you're using. But well, in the end, it doesn't matter. You just have to check that uh, there is a root exploit for uh, your Android version, so you can just poke around. Question too. Yep. <laughs> uh, why uh, you could retrieve only three thousand five hundred apps, even though you found ten thousand? Uh, well, basically, um, I was a little bit lazy. My code is a little bit was a little bit lazy. <laughs> no, uh, in the end, uh, Google, I the first like fifty or one hundred apps were just like uh, I got normal HTTP two hundred responses. I guess because the APK files were small enough. So I just got, yeah, OK, here is the file. And I stored it, and then everything was good. So I automated it and le just let it run. And after these three days, I realized that for big apps, it's um, returning uh, HTTP 206 or something like that. So there's more content coming. And uh, yeah, I just forgot that, that point. So. But basically, I just have to cor correct my code. Or these days, I would use the uh, Google Market API library to just download the apps. That did it answer the question? Um, from your research, have you seen any applications that try to protect themselves? Um, the question mm. goes in the following direction. You mentioned that it's pretty easy once you're root to stay root. Yeah. If you have an application that communicates with a server, let's say, um, as all applications are signed, couldn't you, as an application, first check if it's signed? And if you communicate with a server, once again, check if it's still the original certificate or uh, the original digital signature on the application. Yeah. You mean by changing? Yeah, I know so what you mean. So if you recompile it and sign it with your own yeah. uh, signature, well, it the problem change. is, yeah, the problem is actually that um, it's uh, like the app is unpacking itself. So the APK file is already is installed on the Android device. So it's somehow unpacking. And first of all, I don't think that um, 
the Android app has access to the original APK file. Even if it had, it, it, it wouldn't know if, if, if the unpacked version is, uh, is still correct. So I guess you could implement some, some things, but the problem is still the same. When you root, you have more permissions uh, or, yeah, all privileged and can also always Okay, so nothing stuff. in this direction you have seen with all the applications? Not that far. Well, I'll, have, I'll, have some, uh, I'll have some crashes with the decompiler. And I'm not sure if if the um, apps are trying like uh, re uh, anti-reversing techniques, but um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Any more questions? Nobody. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>